Good morning, everyone. I am continuing in my series on hilarious generosity. How many were not here last week? Good. I'm going to review just a little bit, and then I'm going to get into the message today. And so you can get everything that the Lord has for you. This term, hilarious generosity, I actually took it out of the Bible. Can you believe that? It's out of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7 in the Passion Translation. It says this, Let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it, let it spring up freely from the joy of giving. All because God loves hilarious generosity. So if God loves hilarious generosity, that means that I want to be that. I want to be what God loves. Proverbs 11.25 says this, A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. So we are believing for a revival of giving. Now all of the kids are in with us today. This is family day. So all of the kids are in with us. So we are believing and we're asking God for a revival of giving. Last week we looked at Acts chapter 4. Where the people in the New Testament church were so overtaken with giving that they were literally giving everything away. They were selling their houses and possessions. They were so moved by giving that God had released a grace in them to be a hilarious giver. How many know when you move into that type of giving, is, is actually, there's a joy in it. How many know there's a joy in giving? That some of you, the Lord wants to release wealth into your hands, and you will find that the greatest joy of your life is not using your wealth to buy material possessions, but the greatest joy of your life is to give the wealth that God has given you. You actually find more joy in that than going out and buying a new car or a new boat or a new house. And so there's a joy that comes with giving. That's why it's hilarious. Is that when we move into that type of giving, it really is a supernatural grace and joy that comes on us. Acts chapter 4 says this, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. Wouldn't it be great if nobody among us lacked for anything? How many know that if people were just more, more generous, there would be no lack? In the entire world. There would be no one starving. There would be no one going without meals. There would be no orphans. There would be no widows that are suffering. There would, we would wipe out foster care. Just if the Christians would be more generous. Just if we would say, I'm going to give myself to this thing called hilarious generosity. The whole earth would not lack. And so, the, 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 the idea that the earth is overpopulated is a lie. That's a lie from the enemy. If people were just more generous, there would be no poverty in the earth. There would be no starving in the earth. So, the problem is, is that we have a bunch of people that are hoarders instead of givers. But once we move into generosity, actually we, we, we get to this place where, where we realize the term where you cannot outgive God 
we actually realize that that is very true. The term in the Bible in 2 Corinthians 9, 7 is a term liberal, to be a liberal giver. In that, it means to be open-handed in your giving, expecting nothing in return. So this is the giver that God wants us to be. So the first thing we discussed last week is that total freedom is being possessed by nothing but God. How many of we have people in the church that are saved, that are, that are blood-bought, speak in tongues, but God doesn't totally possess them? Material possessions possess them. They're so far in debt with material possessions that they're swimming in debt. How I many of God wants you to be out of debt? You know, if you're out of debt, instead of paying the bank and, and all your money just flying out the window, you might actually have a little bit left over to give and to use for yourself. Instead of living paycheck to paycheck, God wants you to be out of debt and be blessed so that you can be a blessing to other people. I mean, if you can't hardly pay your bills, you can't be a blessing to anybody. You're just trying to survive yourself. But the way that God pulls you out of that is not constantly looking for somebody to give to you. The way you get yourself out of that is becoming a giver is moving into hilarious generosity. That's why the Bible says, God says, try me in this. Just try it. So we have to, we, we have to stop always looking for people to give to us. Why don't somebody give me this or give me that? Or, or, we have to reverse that and say, no, no, I'm going to be a giver. I'm going to give, maybe I don't have much money to give, but I'm going to give somebody an encouraging word today. I'm going to give somebody some love today. So, the second thing we talked about is don't withhold what God has called you to give. We read the scripture, Proverbs eleven twenty four. Those that withhold live in lack, but those that move in the generosity, God gives them more and more and more. So eventually, you have to stop leaning on your own understanding and lean into God's Word and believe what the Bible says. And just say, you know, I'm going to believe what the Bible says. I'm just going to do that and try that out instead of leaning into my own understanding. So generosity is a readiness, a willingness to give more than is necessary, than expected. Most people only give what is expected or necessary. But God wants you to be a person that gives more because that's what God does. If you have the nature of God living on inside of you, why do you want to contain that? Won't you let it out? Why don't you let that spirit of generosity, that well that's within you, out of yourself? And in that, you will become a hilarious giver. You will become that. The third thing we talked about is you cannot deliver yourself from yourself until you surrender yourself. We sang about it this morning. Until you surrender all, you will never know the fullness of God. Everybody wants the fullness of God, but we really, we really don't want to surrender all. Or we say we surrender all in church, but by the time we get to the car, we're back in self mode again. And what happens is people stop believing you. They're like, oh, they're saying they're changed again. And, and, and nobody believes you anymore. So until you really, really surrender all, that's getting on your knees and saying, God, I repent for my selfishness. I repent for my stinginess. How many know that stinginess? You need to repent of that. The Bible says a stingy man can receive nothing from the Lord. So we don't want to be that. We want to be someone 
that's able to receive. And in that, we must be constantly in a state of giving. So, generosity will change your life. Has anybody ever moved into generosity and you say, that has changed my life? Generosity completely changed who I am. And so this morning, may, you might be a person that no one has ever accused you of being generous. No one has ever said, that is a generous person. People have only accused you of being tight and stingy. But I'm believing today, just like I said last week, that's changing that you're going to be the most generous person that you know. Anybody receive that? I want to be the most generous person I know. I don't want to withhold my love from somebody because I don't think they deserve it. Just because somebody maybe has done me wrong or talked about me behind my back, I don't want to withhold my love from them. I don't want to withhold my respect. I don't want to withhold what God has called me to give. I want to constantly be in a state of giving my time, my money, and my love to everybody around me. Selfishness keeps you from giving. It keeps you locked into who you are and your wants and your desires. And, and, and it's all about you. You're self-absorbed and self-centered. And it's all about your world and, and how many likes you get on social media and, and who, how, many, how many followers you have. Listen, let me tell you something. I mean, life's, life's more than that. Life's bigger than that. Don't be so self-absorbed. God wants you to break out of that in Jesus' name. So what you give to God, God sanctifies it. He multiplies it, and then He anoints it. Sanctification. It's a term you, you might not have heard much of before, but sanctify means that God separates it so the devil cannot touch it. You know, when God sanctifies your life, you become sanctified because now the devil cannot touch you. Some of you, the devil has his fingerprints all over your life because you have never moved into sanctification. You move into sanctification by fully surrendering your life to God. Then God sanctifies your life where the devil cannot touch you. He removes the fingerprints of the devil off of your life. But some of you, the devil can mess with you anytime he wants because you've been saved, but you hadn't been sanctified. So some of you need to move into sanctification. Some of you need your money to be sanctified. Your money is not sanctified. The devil can mess with your finances anytime he wants because you, you're not a tither, you're a tipper. The way you sanctify your money is you say, God, this money is yours. I'm a steward of this money. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you. And, 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 and the sign that you have the revelation that your money belongs to God is that you are a tither. Now, some of you can't even sm spell tithe. So let me explain it real 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 clearly to you. It's a tenth, what I believe, a tenth of the gross of your income. That's what I give from. I tithe from my gross. That means if I get a refund, I don't tithe on my refund, my tax refund, because I already tithed on it. Now, my goal is to give a tithe. I don't give out an obligation. I give out a revelation. So I say, Lord, I have no problem with the tithe, but if you want me to give more, I'll give more. So my goal is always to give more than a tithe. Hopefully, one point in my life, I can give away 50% of my income or even more. Right now, my goal is 20%. I have five kids at home still. So I use a lot of that, the, my income on my kids. Somebody say amen. amen. So until I get rid of all the kids, 
they're going to tie up a lot of the money. But hopefully that's a soon day. So, how many know that Jesus is a hilarious giver? How many know because we, we love him because he first loved us? How many know that Jesus is always there? He will never leave us or forsake us. He is always there ready to give to us. He is the perfect example of hilarious generosity. He is. Now let me ask you a question if you're married here. How can your husband have bad feelings toward you if when he comes home, you meet him at the door and say, hey, honey, I've been praying for you all day. And you know something else, honey? Yes, yes. I think you are a great man. Yes, tell me more. I am so proud of you. You are the greatest husband on the earth. Oh my gosh, this is so great. So instead of being mad at your husband all the time, if you give him those words of respect and love, I mean, oh, he will give you back what you want. But if you have two people that are takers, selfish people, you have a miserable marriage. And the husband says to the wife, yes, I will do anything you want. Do you want a massage for two hours tonight? Yes, I am your man. I am your masseuse for the night. How can a wife hate a husband that is always giving to her? that remembers every anniversary, that remembers every birthday, and actually plans for it, and doesn't wait to the last second. You see what giving does? It makes a miserable relationship a happy relationship. Just two people willing to not just think about themselves, willing to think about their partner. And so if you have a miserable marriage, it's because you have two people who are always thinking about themselves. And constantly, y'all both are trying to get blood out of a turnip. It ain't going to happen. Remember, if you want something, you must first give it. And as you give it, you receive it back. As you give it, you receive it back. That's how God's economy works. So we are hilarious givers. How many are receiving that? If you don't want to be miserable in life, you need to move into hilarious generosity. Selfish people are miserable. Miserable. They might have money. They might have things. But that does not fill the hole in their soul. Because the nature of God, if it lives on the inside of you, it will come out of you. So God wants to re remove the miserable on us and release some joy on us. So this morning, I want to talk about the aroma of generosity. Some of you have an aroma of generosity on you. People can actually smell a generous person. They can. And everybody loves the aroma that a generous person has on them. That's why they draw people to them. That's why they actually, they, a generous person will draw money to them. A generous person will draw influence. A generous person will draw anointing. A generous person draws those things to them. A stingy and selfish person, the, the, the blessings of God bounce off of them. The blessings of God are coming to you. You hear me? Anybody receive that? They're coming to you. But it must be received with the soil of generosity. That's the only way the blessing, or they're going to bounce right off of you. You say, I never receive any blessings from God because you are a negative Nancy. You're just negative, negative. You're negative about everybody, every situation. You're always waiting for the next shoe to fall. That's why the blessings of God are bouncing off of you. If you don't have the soil of generosity, you will not be able to receive 
everything that's coming down the pipe for you. Because there's a lot of blessings that are coming to you, but you must cultivate the soil. You must get the soil ready to receive what God has for you. God wants to bless your marriage, your family. He wants to bless your life. And it's all contingent on you getting the revelation that God has called me to be a giver and not a taker. 1 Chronicles 21-24. David said this, I will not give as an offering to the Lord something that cost me nothing. What does that mean? That means generosity will cost you something. It will cost you something. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. When was the last time that you gave something to somebody that had value? I'm not talking about bringing your clothes down to Goodwill. I'm talking about giving away stuff that you were going to throw away anyway. Oh, I'm such a generous person. I was going to throw this away, but I'm going to call somebody and give it away. No, no, no. I'm not talking about that kind of giving. I'm talking about a giving that hurt. Like you would, man, you, you were like, Man, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills this month. And you telling me, God, to give away that amount of money? I don't, I, I don't even know how I can do that. Well, that is when you know you've moved into generosity because it hurts. It cost you something. So God will put you around people who you cannot stand and see if you will be a giver. Will you withhold the giver that's on the inside of you because you don't like the imperfections of the people that are around you? You say, hey, I, I don't like these people, God. I ain't giving them nothing. I'm not giving them any love. I'm not giving them any time. I'm not giving them any encouragement. You are withholding the nature of God on the inside of you. So the Lord wants you to constantly be in a state where the aroma of generosity is being, is, is being smelled on you. John 12, 3. It says, And Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped His feet with her hair. And the whole house was filled with the fragrance of, of the oil. The aroma filled the whole house. Have you ever walked into somebody's house and you knew there was something different in that house? Either you smelled negativity and strife or you smelled the very nature of God. Kindness and giving and loving. Have you ever smelled that aroma in somebody's house? Well, that, your life is giving off an aroma. If you've been sucking on lemons and you're sour all the time, nobody's going to want to be around you. You say, why am I always lonely and by myself? And why? Because you are a sour person. You only see uh, uh, the, half, the glass half full. Every now and then, I mean half empty, see it half full. I mean, I mean you might need to get around... Somebody that's just uh, uh, full of joy and positive every night. And let it rub off on you. Find the most joyful person in the church and, and, and hang around them. Maybe some of that negativity will jump off of you. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. So God might want you to be nice to somebody. And you, you might say being nice to them is like dying a thousand deaths. No, no, no. You need to give of yourself the very nature of God on the inside. Give that to them. You're killing self and allowing God to flow through you. So this, if you're going to do this, you must draw from a supernatural well. Now, somebody, y'all stay with me now. How many of you have a well on the inside of you? The Bible says, out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. 
Spring up, O well, into my soul. Some of you never draw from the well that's on the inside of you. You stay in your mind all the time. You need to get out of your mind and draw from the well. That's how you're going to be nice to people you can't stand. That's how you're going to be able to give money, even though you are a, not a giver at all. In fact, you hate when anybody ever talks about money or giving. You have to draw from a supernatural well. So that's the place where God wants us to live. Not just on Sunday mornings, but every day. And we will have that river of life, that river of joy flowing out of us. But it's all contingent on you saying yes to hilarious generosity. So how many here possess the aroma of generosity? Anybody? If you don't, just say it by faith. Listen, listen. It's not faking it. Sometimes it's faith in it, right? You say, if I, I feel like if I, I'm, 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 I'm faking it. No, 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 no. You got to faith it till you become it. If you never step out and say, I'm not like this, but I want to become this. I want to be the most generous person I know. So I'm going to faith it. I'm going to act like it. I'm going to give somebody, I don't even know, $20 today. Or $100. Let me give them a Ben Franklin. So, the aroma of generosity, that's what we're going to possess. The second thing you got to know is that you must exchange providers. 1 Kings 17, there was a famine in the land. People were starving to death. People were eating their own children. That's how bad the famine was. Elijah meets with a widow who is gathering sticks to prepare a last meal for her and her son. Listen to the word of the Lord. She told Elijah, Elijah said, what you doing? Elijah said, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I might go in and prepare for myself and my son. A prepare a meal that we may eat it and die. So Elijah comes on this woman. She's preparing her last meal. They're going to eat the last bit they have left and they're going to die. Elijah says, don't, don't eat it. Give it to me. Now just think about that. If you had your last little bit in your hand and, God, and a man of God says, don't eat that, give it to me. You would think, you got to be crazy. I ain't giving this to you. But the word of the Lord, hear me, says she believed and obeyed. And she gave to the man of God her last meal. She invited the supernatural into her house. She was a widow who had been providing for herself and her son. Now she had exchanged providers. Now her provider became Jehovah Jireh. So no longer was she providing for herself and her household any longer. Now Jehovah Jireh was providing. You see, until you exchange providers, you will never move in the hilarious generosity. You will always be just in your head. And you will give a tithe out of religious duty, but you will never move into revelation. God wants us to move out of religious duty into revelation. To where we exchange providers. And then look what happens. Verse 14. It says, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall a jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth. So God said, listen, you're never going to suffer again, because I am Jehovah Jireh, and I will provide for you the rest of your life. Just sit back. And watch me work. This is what happens to people who move in the hilarious generosity. Can somebody say amen? amen? This is what we are. So, how do you know God has given you something? How do you know something is from the Lord? 
Because it goes beyond your ability to get it. You know, I, I, there's no way I could have got that job. That's beyond my education level. That's beyond my expertise. But God has given it to me. That's why I know it's from the Lord. So God wants to give you things. God wants to give you a job. God wants to give you all of those things that's beyond your ability. But you must first exchange providers. Until that, you will be operating on a totally natural level. You will only get a job that, that's, that just meets up to your education level or your, or your expertise. But once you, once you have the exchange and get the revelation, all of a sudden God moves in to stay and you will never lack again. The third thing is there will be no more devourer. How many know that everybody tithes? All people on the earth tithe. The only difference is, is that tithing Christians, we decide where we tithe. Because God pr protects the rest of our money from all the devourers. So people that don't tithe, they give their money to the doctor. They give it to the mechanic. They tithe, but they have all the devourers. They give, it, they give it to the bank because they got payments on everything, their couch, their car. Some people pay payments on their dog. They bought their dog on credit. They give it to everybody. So hear me. Hear this truth. Everybody tithes. But we, as tithing Christians, decide who we tithe to. And we bring our tithe to the house of the Lord. Because that's what Scripture says. Malachi 3.10 Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me in this, says the Lord of hosts. I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that there is not room enough to receive it. And, verse 11, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. So, how about no devourer in your marriage? How many would like no devourer in your marriage? See, some people relate this just to money, but how about no devourer in your marriage or in your relationships or your business or your job or your physical body? No devourer anywhere in your life. The tithe is a spiritual principle. It belongs to the Lord. So if we bring our tithes to the storehouse, the devourer is rebuked in every part of our life. That's what I believe and that's what I receive. There's no devourer that will devour my physical body in Jesus' name. Because I stand on the word of the Lord. No devourer will come into my family and devour my children and to devour my marriage and to devour my, all those things and devour the church. No, I obey the word of the Lord. I bring my tithes and offerings to the storehouse. I say, this belongs to you, God. I'm a steward of your finances. And the devourer is rebuked from my midst. There will be no devourer in any, any, any part of my life. But if you're not a tither, you can't pray like that. See, it's just not money. It's when you move into hilarious generosity, it now encompasses every part of your life. And if not, you have a thief in different parts of your life. You have a thief in your family. You have a thief in your business. You have a thief in your body. So you must rebuke the thieves off of your life. Actually, the Lord will do it. He rebukes the devourers from our midst. And then lastly, God gives us a willing heart. A willing heart. Exodus 35, 21 says, Then everyone came whose heart was stirred, and everyone whose spirit was willing. And they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting, for all of its service, and for the holy garments. Verse 29, Then the children of Israel brought a freewill offering to the Lord. All the men and women whose hearts were willing 
to bring material for all kinds of work which, which the Lord, by the hand of Moses, which was commanded to be done. So, willing heart. Remember this. Giving never works if it's forced. It never works if you feel manipulated to give. Have you ever been in a service or a meeting and you had somebody get up and they talked about giving, but you felt like they were, they were robbing, they were manipulating you? You ever felt that? That's not out of a willing heart. The Lord is a rewarder. He rewards us. He inspires us. And that's how we should give a willing heart to where we say, yes, I want to be a giver. And from that, it easily flows. So I don't want here for anybody to ever feel manipulated in the giving, but people that say yes and have a willing heart ready to give and, and, and are blessed because of it. So this is what God loves. God loves somebody that has a willing heart, somebody that doesn't feel manipulated or forced into giving or coerced. So giving never works when it's not your choice to do it. The Lord wants you to choose. That's why God wants to give us a willing heart. And look what it says in Ezekiel 36, 5 and 6, verse 5 and 6 of Ezekiel, I mean Exodus, Exodus 36. It says, the people bring much more than enough for the service of the work of the Lord that He's commanded us to do. And now the people were restrained from bringing, from giving anything else. So in other words, Moses had to stand up and say, listen, y'all are giving too much. Stop giving. Y'all got to slow down on the giving. We have so much that we have more than enough. How many of this is what God wants for His house, for you, for everyone that calls on the name of the Lord, that we have more than enough. Anybody receive that? We're not living paycheck to paycheck, but more than enough. So, this is what God wants for your family. What, what, kind, what kind of family or what kind of household would it be where the wife has to tell the husband, stop loving me so much. You're loving me too much. Please stop it. You got too much, too much love. Stop it. You are killing me with all this kindness and all these compliments. What kind of house would it be if you tell your wife, listen, just stop already. You're just, you're just, you're just honoring me and respecting me too much. It's getting ridiculous. This is ridiculous giving. Outrageous giving. But remember, it's, you, you got to realize it's not just about money. It's a lifestyle that we live to where out of our belly flows hilarious generosity. It's who we are. It's how we live. It's how we go throughout our day. It's how our family works. It's how our church works. It's how everything works. This is a key in the kingdom of God. The early church had it. I believe we're getting it back. I believe the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. I believe God's going to give some of you in here ideas and how to, how to develop things, develop your business, maybe, maybe to invent something, and God will pour millions of dollars through you. So I don't know about that. Well, that's probably not you. Let somebody else have it. Come on, if you don't want it, I want it. 